Tejo Varimidam Yata Vini Mayat Mini Mayo Yatra Tisargo Misha Dam Nasvina Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Di Mahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. Uh, the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitra votra. Paramo nirmatsaranam satam. Vedyam vastava matra vastu. Shivadam tapatra unmulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kim Vapare Ishwaraha. Sadyohidi Avurudyate Tra. Krite Bihi Susubis Takshana. Completely rejecting all religious activities which were materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by, uh, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nikama kalpataro galitam fulam. Sukamakad Amrita Dravya Samyutam Pibata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam Mahur Ahuraska Bhuvibhavakaha O expert and thoughtful men, relish Shimad Bhagavatam. O expert and thoughtful men, relish the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice is already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidyan Taksto Padrani Bidunoti Suhit Satam 
to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is it self-righteous activity. And one who, uh, and for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Islamat Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo kama loba dayas chaye cheta etar and avidam stitvam satve prasidati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangasya jayate. When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya shayante jasyakaramani drista evat manishwari Thus bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material and enables one to come at once to the stage of some sayam samagram. Understanding the uh, understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, chapter 15, verse number Twenty seven, and we're going to finish the purport today. Desika larta yuktani Ritapo pasamanicha Ritapo pasamanicha Haranti smaratas chitam Haranti smaratas chitam Govinda bihitani me. So now the last paragraph of this purport. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord and the living beings are both described as sanatana, or eternal. And the Lord's abode, far above the material sky, is also described as sanatana. The living being is invited to live in the sanatana existence of the Lord. And the process which can help a living being to approach the Lord's abode where the liberated activity of the soul is exhibited is called sanatana dharma. One cannot, however, reach the eternal abode of the Lord without being freed from the misconception of material identification. And the Bhagavad Gita gives us the clue how to achieve this stage of perfection. The process of being liberated from the misconception of material identification is called in different stages, fruit of activity, empiric philosophy, and devotional service up to transcendental realization. Such transcendental realization is made possible by dovetailing all the above items in relation with the Lord. 
Prescribed duties of the human being, as directed in the Vedas, can gradually purify the sinful mind of the conditioned soul and raise him to the stage of knowledge. The purified stage of acquiring knowledge becomes the basis of devotional service to the Lord. As long as one is engaged in researching the solution of the problems of life, his knowledge is called jnana, or purified knowledge. But on realizing the actual solution of life, one can become situated in the devotional service of the Lord. The Bhagavad Gita begins with the problems of life by discriminating the soul from the elements of matter and proves by all reason and argument that the soul is indestructible in all circumstances and that the outer covering of matter, the body and the mind, change for another term of material existence, which is full of miseries. The Bhagavad Gita is therefore meant for terminating all different types of miseries. And Arjuna took shelter of this great knowledge, which had been imparted to him during the Kurukshetra battle. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Maya affects people in four ways. Uh, people start out being a protagonist for uh, religiosity. So, that's, that's what happens when someone comes in contact with Krishna consciousness. Uh, and usually because uh, they have been suffering and they're looking for a way out of this suffering and misery and they meet a devotee and the devotee promises them if they start chanting following the rules and regulations of Krishna consciousness their miseries will go away and it's true so when their miseries go away they uh, become they realize that they're fortunate and then they become happy. And in that state, they become a protagonist of religion. But if they neglect following the rules and regulations and chanting, uh, and that neglect, negligence puts them on a slippery slope, and all of a sudden they develop the desire for economic development and starting some business or some venture, you know, selling jewelry or whatever. And, and once they get some success in economic development, the third point, the way Maya attacks us, is we become protagonists of sense gratification. And when we're frustrated in sense gratification, economic development, and mundane religiosity, at that point we become a mayavadi and think that we have become one with God. So these are the four ways that maya attacks us. So uh, we have to uh, realize that spiritual life is like walking on a razor's edge. If you're walking on a razor's edge and you make a false move, you get cut. So whenever we become negligent in strictly following the uh, regulative principles, there we get cut. And we get, uh, let's say, damaged and weakened. And then Maya finds space to enter into our mind and pollute us. So, the uh, Prabhupada explains here, uh, he, the Prabhupada explains in a, in a letter, he says, you cannot, you cannot be a, a devotee and neglect following the regulative principles, which includes chanting our rounds properly. So one cannot, however, reach the eternal abode of the Lord without being free from the misconception of material identification. And the Bhagavad Gita gives us the clue how to achieve the stage of perfection. Well, uh, the misconception of material identification, that's everybody's disease. Uh, we, and it begins by uh, 
the desire to like be a competitor of Krishna and uh, try and dominate some part of nature or attempt to dominate all of nature. So therefore, yesterday we came upon an interesting point and I asked uh, when the Bodhi to look up on the internet, what is the goal of science? And we found uh, that when the uh, Enlightenment period started in the, in the, near the end of the Middle Ages, and you had two big uh, scientists, philosophers, Francis Bacon, an Englishman, and René Descartes, a Frenchman. And both of them were advocates of science and and there were there were scientists and and uh, logicians and mathematicians and they both predicted that what the goal of science would be francis bacon said that science will uh, increase the mercies well he wasn't talking about the mercies of god he was the, talking about the mercies of science because he said science will make what will eliminate a lot of the distress and suffering of material life and help us to dominate nature and then Descartes said it even more emphatically that uh, the purpose of science is to uh, eliminate all the uh, suffering that one encounters in nature and to actually control nature. Now, both of them predicted that in the future, science would produce many little gadgets that make life easier. Gadgets like washing machines and dryers and gadgets like uh, uh, vaccines and gadgets like uh, digital technology. I mean, they, they, they predicted, they didn't know about digital technology, but they predicted that many little gadgets would be produced by science and improvements made by which man can control nature and eliminate suffering. Well, let's look at this from the point of view of, of uh, Vedic philosophy. Uh, Prabhupada clearly, I mean, Krishna clearly says that daivihi esa gunamai, mama maya duradeya. He said that my daivi maya, or the three modes of material nature, are impossible to overcome. And the actual word is impossible. So, in, in fact, I'll tell you where that is. If you read the Bhagavad Gita translation of that verse, it doesn't seem so emphatic, but in, in the alternate translations that Prabhupada gives, he makes it very clear that it's impossible. So the translation is, uh, this divine nature of mind consisting of three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome. But if we Look at Shimad Bhagavatam 111 34. It says, Daivi Maya, nature's stringent laws are impossible to overcome. So, uh, and so one, let's t make sure about that. 111 39. Let's take a look at that. 111. Because this is a fundamental point. Here, Dick, uh, Bacon and, and, Dest and uh, Descartes are saying that science will uh, eliminate all the miseries caused by material nature and, and, and permit scientists to dominate nature. And 1, 11.39, Krishna says, Let's see here. 
Oh, I'm sorry. One eleven thirty-four. Sorry. In the Bhagavad Gita, this fact is very vividly described. Bhagavad Gita 7.14. It is said, the deluding energy is my potency, and thus it is not possible for the dependent living beings to supersede the strength of the material modes. So here we have these, these uh, audaciously puffed up little scientists, Francis Bacon and René Descartes, who are considered like the fathers of uh, modern science, claiming something that is impossible. And this is what's called misleading people. And, and up until today, that same idea is there, that science is going to improve our life and eventually conquer nature. And, it's, and no, in other words, they're trying to do something that is impossible to do. And because of that, they mislead people. And, and, and young kids are taught that, you know, science and logic and reason, this is, going, this is going to save us, save humanity from suffering. It doesn't save anybody. It makes people more suffering, more suffering. Gives them more suffering. So this, these type of misconceptions are very prevalent today. And because of that, there's more suffering. So Prabhupada says here, that the process of being liberated from the misconception of material identification is called, in different stages, fruit of activity, empiric philosophy, and devotional service. So there's a gradual progression for a human being to, and, and what's the purpose of that progression? Well, it's to understand that we're all subordinate to, to Krishna or God. So, uh, Krishna gives a process by which people can have uh, attained their material desires through fruit of activity, performing Vedic karmakanda uh, rituals. And if they have a proper pundit or brahmana who's, who's directing them, he'll also explain that, look, uh, this is just a palliative, uh, what you call, a palliative measure given by Krishna or a dispensation given by Krishna to encourage materialistic people to easily get achieve uh, uh, some material desires so that they calm down a little bit, not be so panicked or, or fanatical, and realize that their salvation is through following Krishna's uh, instructions. And then from there, to develop some equilibrium so that they can uh, engage in empiric philosophy. Okay, now what's empiric philosophy? The philosophy of uh, like Descartes and uh, Francis Bacon and others that you can uh, improve life through uh, uh, philosophical uh, analysis of uh, what your situation is, what the reality of your situation is. So what is that philosophical analysis? That is, uh, we're born, we get old, we get sick, and we die. And that happens to everybody, even the greatest scientists. And nobody can stop that process. So therefore, all these things are forced on us. And we're not really independent. And therefore, in our dependency, uh, who are we actually dependent on? We should be dependent on Krishna because whoever made the door and lock also made a key, how to open it. So how to open the, the door and enter the uh, Vaikuntha Dwaram, the door to Vaikuntha, unlock it, it's by following Krishna's instructions. And, and therefore, after many, many lifetimes of speculation, one may eventually come to the conclusion, Vasudeva Saramiti, Krishna, you are everything for me. And when you come to that conclusion, then you give up all speculation and you just strictly follow Krishna's instructions. That is 
the path of devotional service because uh, you know you might get uh, bhakti uh, you might get a uh, bhakti shastri degree and then you might get a bhakti uh, vaya bhava degree and then you might, might get a bhakti uh, uh, a superior degree bhakti vedanta degree and then you may even go even further beyond that but if you don't come to the conclusion that I should be engaged all all the time in devotional service, all that education is a waste of time. Because the goal of the education is to be engaged full time in devotional service. So either you go right away to full time devotional service, or you go the slow way uh, through uh, performing rituals to achieve your desires and then getting involved in philosophical speculation and eventually come to devotional service. So uh, what Prabhupada was doing was to teach us to come directly in one strike to devotional service. And this uh, is explained also in the end of the eighth chapter where Prabhupada writes something very interesting in purport. He says, the beauty of Krishna consciousness, however, is that by one stroke, by engaging in devotional service, one can surpass all the rituals of the different orders of life. That's at the 8th uh, chapter, 28th verse of Bhagavad Gita in the purport. So this is brilliant. This is a wonderful thing that Prabhupada did. Uh, instead of dilly-dallying in the material world, playing around with rituals and philosophical speculation and so forth, he immediately brought us to the level of devotional service. And if simply maintaining that level by following the rules and regulations and chanting properly our rounds every day and engaging in service, we can attain the highest perfection very quickly. And even to the point of being able to go back to Godhead in this lifetime. So, uh, such transcendental realization, that is, uh, understanding that my real, the real goal is pure devotional service. Because that's the only way one can understand Krishna. Bhaktiya mam abhijananti yavan yas chasmi tatvato tatvato. So then, therefore it says, such transcendental realization is made possible by dovetailing all the above items in relation with the Lord, whether it's rituals, whether it's philosophical speculation, or devotional service. It should all be dovetailed uh, for the pleasure of the Lord. Some Sadir Harihotoshanam. So he says, prescribed duties of human being as directed in Vedas can gradually purify the sinful mind of the conditioned soul and raise him to the stage of knowledge. The purified stage of acquiring knowledge becomes the basis of devotional service to the Lord. As one, as long as one is engaged in researching the solution of the problems of life, his knowledge is called jnana, or purified knowledge. But on realizing the actual solution of life, one becomes situated in the devotional service of the Lord. That's it, right there. So unless we come to that conclusion, all the studies that we make is actually a waste of time. And here it's very clear that the solution to all the problems of life is engagement in unalloyed devotional service with, uh, with the intention of pleasing Krishna always. So Prabhupada says, the Bhagavad Gita begins with the problems of life by discriminating the soul from the elements of matter and proves by all reason and argument that the soul is indestructible in all circumstances and that the outer covering of matter, the body and the mind, change for another term of material existence which is full of miseries. The Bhagavad Gita is therefore meant for terminating all different types of miseries. See, that's what Francis Bacon and René Descartes said, that science will eliminate all the, all the different types of miseries and give us many little gadgets that make our life happier. And they wrote that 500 years ago. I mean, they were brilliant men, but they were on the wrong track. It's not science. It's the science of Krishna consciousness. It's not the material science that's going to do that. 
And Arjuna took shelter of this great knowledge which had been imparted to him during the Kurukshetra battle. So we should understand what is the real science. It's the science of Krishna consciousness, knowing Krishna and engaging eternally in his devotional service. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Simply studying. Yeah, simply studying. Yeah. Well, let's see, that's what Prabhupada did. Did any of us know Bhagavad Gita? No, I didn't know anything about the Bhagavad Gita when I joined. Exactly. Right? But immediately I was taught to offer food to chant Hare Krishna and follow the regular t principles. I say. So even if you and listen to any classes, yeah. If you have no, if you have no qualification, academic qualification, it doesn't matter. It's not really that important. What's important is understanding Krishna is the supreme person I got it, and I am His eternal servant, and the eternal life in the spiritual world is based on devotional service. So whether you do it in the material world or the spiritual, it's the same thing. And also, also Prabhupada has given very uh, factual example of the gopis. They never studied anything. Yeah. Of course, no immediately the gopis but No, but they're highly accomplished yeah. women. I mean, they have, they, they know all the 64 arts of pleasing Krishna, I'd say. But, but yeah, they, they're not. They're not supposed. They're not like. You assume they're not big scholars, but they are because they know the science of Krishna. Yeah, this is this is the highest science, the science of Krishna. This other science is all junk. These guys are talking about controlling nature. That's something that's impossible. They're still trying to do it now, and they're still being defeated all the time. That's the highest service. Exactly, but for the, some devotees, they, they going on sankirtan. Yeah, going on sankirtan, exactly. So some devotees, they not really, they don't understand that. Rather, they distributing books, Prabhupada's books. Yeah. yeah. So that's the point. Prabhupada did something brilliant. In one stroke, he brought everybody up to to devotional service. You don't have to go through this long. Uh, many lifetime process of gradual elevation, you know, in one stroke. So it's brilliant what he did, and that this was this was Lord Chaitanya's movement. See, uh, uh, the the uh, Narada Bhakti uh, Sutra. I mean, he's talking about Pancha Trikibiti, this you know, that's uh, worshiping the deity, right? But Lord Chaitanya, he talked about Harinam Sankirtan. You see, so both are important, but of the two, Harinam Sankirtan is most important because it's the Yuga Dharma in this age. So you don't have to, you know, get a college degree. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. And then Prabhupada, another brilliant thing he did, and this, this we should do again because it's very important. He said, one man is enough to maintain a temple. So in other words, he sent people out right in the beginning. He sent uh, this one devotee named Subal to New Mexico. And he sent uh, uh, one devotee uh, to Los Angeles. And he sent one devotee uh, to uh, Seattle. And he sent one devotee to Montreal. And he, sent, and he told him, you just start a temple. And here's people, they were new devotees. They didn't really know the philosophy that much. 
They didn't know anything, but they just listened to Prabhupada. They didn't have any money. And they went somewhere and they opened a temple. I did the same thing in, in, in France. You know, and we didn't know anything. All we knew was chant Hare Krishna, do Sankirtan, and preach, and follow these regulative principles, and start a temple. You know what I'm so that's why the movement spread dramatically uh, in, in the early days. You know, they were opening temples in all different little places, all different places. So that should happen again, where we get that pioneering spirit. I mean, just go somewhere and open a temple. You know, and even if it's just one little room, it doesn't matter. And eventually, see, Prabhupada started with that uh, matchless gifts. It's a little small shop, right? And uh, he just and he didn't he didn't have a kitchen, right? He had a kitchen in his little apartment, and that was small also. But uh, you know, he was giving out pieces of apple, cutting a, uh, an apple into different pieces, and giving that as prasadam, and just chanting Hare Krishna. You know, and he started this movement, and after a little while. You know, he took a big risk, uh, $200 a month rent. He didn't have $200, right? But somehow or other, he took the risk, got rented this little shop, and all of a sudden, it all developed into a major movement. And he told his devotees, well, you go here, you go there. You, he sent, uh, he was telling Brahmananda in 1967 to send him to Russia. And then uh, he asked, to, uh, Hans Duda or, or this guy, Shivananda, to open a temple in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, then they sent the, uh, the couples to uh, London to open a temple. And you see, that, why? Because he elevated them right away to the position of, of uh, devotional service. And they were able to do these amazing things. Haribo, all glory to Prabhupada. Yes. No, you 